will be a piece, so I'm kind of wrapping it in a pretty bow, if you will. And it will say, you know, met someone in jail, got married this time. And you might be thinking, how did they meet someone? How, why would they meet somebody? How did that happen? There's a lot to talk about. So I'm really excited to talk about this with you guys, but let's see quickly who's in the chat and yeah, we'll kind of get going. And as I'm going through this, kind of keep in mind some cases that you've heard of in the media, you know, true crime cases, because I'm going to ask at the end for some examples. And of course, there's the kind of more obvious examples, if you will. I mean, I, I used Ted Bundy as the thumbnail because everybody knows how he drew so many women during his trial when he was on trial for such horrific acts. But women flocked to it. They all got there early to get a seat in there so that he would look at them or wink at them. Again, we'll go over all of that, but just kind of keep that in mind, whether it is a male criminal that you're thinking of or a female criminal, because we will certainly talk about it. So let's see who's here. Hey, Paul, Renee, James, Fiddle, Nick, uh, Violet Sky. Hello, Chris, James. Dylan, Richard. All right. So the elephant in the room, and I am going to, I'm going to call you out, Nick, because I know you're not going to be the only one that mentions it. So for those that do know me from the Manson Saga discussion panel, the big, big news today is Leslie Van Houten. So although that's kind of not so much what I'm getting into in tonight's show, if anybody feel free to answer Nick's question, if you, you guys might have already for all I know, <laughs> I haven't, I'm just scrolling through quickly to make sure I say hello to everybody. But yeah, you guys can go over that, fill them in so that everybody's on the same page because a lot of you guys, we do have a lot of crossover with um, YouTube. So yes, big news in the Leslie Van Houten arena. And we will bring her up later on. So let's put a pin in that. Hey, Tony L, welcome. Okay, so heuristophilia, right? So again, as I said, it's the sexual interest in and attraction to people who commit crimes. In some cases, it may be directed towards people in prison for various types of criminal activities. And what I will say is when I was researching this topic for the Manson Saga discussion panel, I only did like an in a nutshell over there, just kind of what made the most sense for that topic we were doing because there's just so much research done. We're here. I can kind of deep dive more into it. And part of my research at the time, <laughs> I say research, is there's so many websites for finding love for a prisoner. Uh, I'm not going to name the sites. You guys can do a quick Google, find it yourselves. But I was scrolling through each of them and it's very interesting the way they have it set up because some of them were pretty forthcoming for, and you can search for male inmates or female inmates. Again, they were pretty forthcoming in why the prisoner was there when, you know, when they seem to be expected to be released. It was very much like a traditional dating app. And it was, I just didn't quite expect that. I don't know what I expected, but I didn't quite expect that. And then some of the websites didn't really get into the crime so much. It was more of the, you know, I'm in here for a few things. I'll be here for a while, but my hobbies are this type or my interests are this type of thing. And I found that very interesting because if someone is, you know, for this topic that we're doing, if someone's seeking somebody who is a criminal and what the research will kind of show is the worse the offender you know, kind of what does that mean? And these dating sites, if you will, for prisoners that don't get into any of that, I was wondering how, how does that work in this context, right? And then I was wondering, I wonder what the success rate is over these different websites for those reasons. I didn't quite at that time feel comfortable maybe and I really should have for this one now that I think about it, um, contacted people who run these websites and just kind of say, you know, here's what I'm doing. 
what is your su success rate or you know what type of traffic flow do you have on your websites because you could get lost on these websites just going through it what people chose to reveal in their profiles or what they didn't because some you could really tell they were skirting around i find that fascinating in itself again you know so someone like all right james you know you're someone i can see perusing these websites not gonna lie hon but yeah, it was it was interesting. So I got I'm not going to name them because I'm not here to advertise them. But do a quick Google, you'll find it yourself. And yeah, it's just, it's just a fascinating rabbit hole to go down. But anyway, let's get back to the psychology talk here because that is what we're here to do, and I'm so excited to do it. So again, hyperstaphylia. So as defined by sexologist Dr. John Money in 1986. It was, quote, a paraphilia of the predatory type in which sexual erotic arousal and facilitation and attainment of orgasm are responsive to and contingent on being with a partner known to have committed an outrage of, or crime such as rape, murder, or armed robbery, end quote. All right, so that is a long ass definition, but... You know, if you get the gist out of it, he's basically saying the um, sexual, ero oh my God, I can't even pronounce it right. <laughs> the sexual erotic arousal and facilitation in attainment of orgasm responsive to and contingent upon being with a partner known to have committed an outrage or crime such as rape, murder, or armed robbery. So those are some very specific and very violent type of criminal activity. And yet these, you know, orgasms, so to speak, are dependent on that, in that level of crime. So, <laughs> what does Renee say? I'm sure they only go for the ones that will send money. You know, I that's a whole nother conversation. Of the, but yeah, that's a huge possibility too. And that is on there too. It's, oh, feel free to donate to my, you know, where they can get like, I don't know if it's called a cantina or type of thing where they can get like little extras and stuff, but that's certainly an option on those sites. So since many violent offenders are incarcerated indefinitely or for long periods of time and their sexual interactions are not permitted in the majority of prisons, this theory does little to explain why women are romantically rather than sexually drawn to incarcerated men. So now it's getting a little bit more away from the physical and more of a romantic type of feeling towards the incarcerated. And in this case, with this research by Dr. John Money, we're looking at more of females being attracted to incarcerated men. So women who are involved in what's called maladaptive relationships with inmates. They meet um, the DSM-4s in Dr. Money's criteria of having paraphilia as it relates to their relationship with inmates. For those who don't know, the DSM is like the psychology Bible. It is not updated very frequently because, again, there's just there's so much in there. But as it does get updated, it's very interesting what things kind of change with time. We can look at, you know, the first publication versus now. And it's just interesting how psychology has evolved. It's it's fascinating. And if you think, oh, this is a little book, I will pick it up. No, 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 no. The DSM is, it, it's a huge book. It, again, it's like the psychology Bible. Every type of diagnosis that you would look for is in this book. It covers everything. So for those who aren't familiar with that. So I remember when I was in college, I was like, I want to buy all of them. And just, yeah, I was crazy, crazy about it. But yes, they do update it. So there's no need to buy all of the past editions. <laughs> so while some women downplay the need for sex, some have intense sexual fantasies that are recurrent and their relationships involve suffering and humiliation and are perceived in fantasy and socially unacceptable. I mean, and that makes sense, right? If you think about your peer group or the people that you work with, if 
you know, one of your close friends or a coworker comes in and says, you know, male or female, oh, I just met this great person. We have such a connection, so on and so forth. And, you know, they're going on and on. And then it's the, the last piece of information that they reveal is, oh, by the way, they're incarcerated for, for five counts of murder or something like that. It's not a socially acceptable thing for the most part. So you could see why women and this, you know, the research is done typically on women or even men too, why they might feel humiliation in revealing that type of information. So they would hold that in, which what does that do? It just feeds in again to this cycle, but it makes a lot of sense why they have to keep this more hush hush because again, it's not socially acceptable in most, in most circumstances. And you might say, wait a minute, there are some cases of what, you know, it's very public, you know, think of star with Charles Manson or, you know, Richard Ramirez and all of the women that loved him and Ted Bundy and Carol Ann Boone, who was, who married him and was very vocal for him. So those aren't the norm. They, your mind goes to them because they're the most common examples and the most talked about examples, but that's really not the norm. So just keep that in mind. Oh, a bunch of you have shown up a little late, but hi, welcome. I'm glad you guys are here. So I'm just doing a quick peek through just to make sure I'm not missing anything. You know, you guys are just kind of chit-chatting about what's going on right now, and that's cool. Um, Renee adds, there's a whole TV show about love during lockup. Yes, yes, there is. Um, I was attracted to a guy with the MBA and button down shirts. <laughs> um, Doug says, I can't believe that they paroled Charles Green, his heinous crimes and lies about his past. The parole board make him if the absolute worst family associates. Okay. All right. Da, 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 da. All right. So to jump back. So since this definition um, that I've gone through, which is found throughout the literature preceding it, there have been other interpretations that have created a large variance within this topic. So there seem to be four patterns that are identifiable in relation to the use of the term. The first is women who pursue romantic relationships with incarcerated offenders. The second is women who participate in and facilitate criminal behavior with a romantic partner. The third, women who are sexually attracted or sexually satisfied by partners participating in criminal behavior. And fourth, women who pursue relationships with and are sexually attracted to serial violent offenders, example, serial killers. So again, there's these four different type of patterns and for me, when I was just researching, you know, just this list of four, I could think of examples of each one. And I'm sure we all could too. There's so much true crime and so many criminals that not everything fits into just one box or one pattern. So this makes a lot of sense. And a good show, I have not watched it in years because I'm not going to lie, part of my COVID goals when 2020 hit was to stop watching TV and just read more. So I've really done well with that. But one of the shows that I was really into, well, anything on Oxygen first and foremost, because it's just a true crime network, let's be honest. But it was uh, Killer Couples. And that was interesting because it showed almost all of these four patterns. And it would, for those who aren't familiar, it would follow, well, obviously Killer Couples. So a couple. And in some of the cases, the woman was just really trying to, you know, please her partner because she you know, didn't want to lose him. And this was what he was into. Um, or maybe, you know, they were both into this type of thing. But then once they found each other, it was just the right toxic meetup that now they could explore this fantasy of theirs together. Again, there was so many different examples of these types of patterns that I just went through. So if you guys haven't seen that show, I would say check it out. It's great. Again, I've done really good with giving up TV since COVID. So I'm going to try to stick to that. But that's a great show that I would say gives a lot of great true cases about these examples. All right. It looks like Mr. Beckham is lost and showed up. Hello. 
So Chris James says, are there men who go for female prisoners besides James Watson? Yes, there are. There actually are. And we'll get to that at the end when I kind of go over the list of examples I have. But again, keep that in mind because I will ask for examples from everybody. Ella says, Richard Ramirez was a hottie, but his murders and rapes did not make him hotter. I wish he wasn't evil. I wish he was Richie who worked at AutoZone or something. <laughs> Very interesting. And thank you for being honest about that. I think it's... It's a fine line, right? Because, I mean, I've been accused too, just being, having this platform that I have of almost, you know, in some cases glorifying, and I hate that term because that's, if it comes off that way, that's certainly not my approach. But I also believe in giving credit where credit is due. And what I mean by that, so before people say, wait a minute, wait a minute, hold on. We all, in the back of our minds can admit when somebody, you know, just looking at their photo, not looking at, you know, their background, are they the CEO of a company or are they, you know, this horrific um, person who has done all these crimes in your community, so on and so forth. Just looking at a photo of somebody, you can admit, yes, this, this man is attractive or yes, this woman is attractive. That doesn't mean that necessarily, you know, I'll just use Richard Ramirez as the example because you mentioned him. That doesn't mean, oh, my God, I'm in love with this person or, oh, my God. You know, it's simply giving credit where credit is due. And I think sometimes that gets misinterpreted. With that being said, there are and we're, we'll go through this research here where because you give what you said, Ella, was really, really good. I'm going to put it back up because. You know, you said you're you're commenting on his physical appearance th that to you, yes, he is this great looking guy, but what he did did not make him more attractive. And on the flip side, there are, as you'll see as I continue this episode, there are women who learned what he did and that made him more attracted to more attractive to them. Because for so long, he was, you know, just regular Richard Ramirez. You know, I'll just use your example, Richard Ramirez at AutoZone. And he didn't get the type of following from all these women that he did when he was just, you know, every day out on the street. But once he was locked up, now he did. So, so it can go, it's interesting how that dynamic shifted, but I do, again, thank you for giving, you know, being honest in that because there are, I think there's a, people think there's a fine line with, you can't give credit. You know, there are, I'll just say the the most, the obvious female example, Jody Arias. You know, every, we're all familiar with that case. I, I covered that here on my channel and I did that uh, with, collab with Paul from the podcast, my co-host. And it's interesting because she's one of the most quote unquote popular inmates that men write to. And to give credit where credit is due, she's not a bad looking woman, but how she's been glorified because of what she did or how men see her. And we'll get to that. It, it's just fascinating. It's fascinating. So I, I definitely want to respond to you guys because I love to talk about this stuff. So, um, all right, let me just make sure I'm caught up and then we'll continue. Morbid fascination isn't glorifying it. Thank you. Very well said. Uh, Ramirez had good bone structure on his face. <laughs> uh, crazy women have an allure, perhaps. People think I'm strange because I like true crime. Oh my gosh, I think you're normal because you like true crime. It's there. Yeah, no, it's. True crime has definitely blown up in the last decade or so with podcasts and all that. It just, you know, I've always grown up into true crime, you know, with being into true crime. And it was one of those, I'm just very vocal and just says, say it like it is. But there wasn't other people to talk a lot about it because it, if they were into it, they weren't talking about it because it wasn't normal. Now everybody's, you know, oh, did you, you know, hear the true crime 
a garage episode? You know, did you listen to this podcast or did you see that documentary on Netflix? It's just, it's everywhere. It just saturated our culture. So now it's a little bit more normal. Um, Ellis says, yes, exactly. I can separate looks. Richard's face to me was uniquely beautiful. Even the court artist at the trial said the same thing. Of course. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, Dylan says Richard, before he was famous, had to buy hookers and never had a girlfriend. Yeah, exactly. Rick, um, Dylan, exactly. Oh my God, I went to call you Richard. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, I get to Diane Downs later on. <laughs> you better believe she's on my list. <laughs> uh, is okay looking. I think more guys are fascinated by your sex habits. James, you know what? You wouldn't be wrong. You would not be wrong in that. Okay, so now that we've talked about the four different patterns um, that were identifiable, right? So we get in now into uh, Sheila Eisenberg's research. Out of all of the research that I have reviewed from all these um, um, researchers or authors, I have to say I most gravitate toward Sheila Eisenberg. So if this topic is something that's interesting to you, check out Sheila Eisenberg. I'm just giving a sort of in a nutshell. I did read through all of the research that I could find online and it's so fascinating. So again, if you're into this, do yourself a service. And I actually, in the description bar, will be linking all of the authors that I uh, looked more into for this episode to give credit where credit is due to these great researchers if there's any of them in particular when you're going back that you want to know more of or find fascinating, it'll all be in the description um, down bar. So anyway, now that I've mentioned that, I meant to say that at the beginning and I totally forgot. So, so Sheila Eisenberg, her observation was that women in love with prisoners view their relationships as something special as quote unquote true love, which is deep, romantic and full of passion. These women could be so attracted to extreme male dominance and aggression that they actually have chosen aggressive men who had the potential to become delinquent and convicted of a crime in the future. So that's very interesting, right? Another explanation could be that the women are only able to endure their difficult situation if they really love their partners deeply and without any doubts. In Eisenberg's 1991 research, it offered a number of reasons on why women would seek incarcerated men as partners. So take a quick sip. Okay. So these include the ideas that one, some women seek partners who need caretaking and in their relationship, they be they become that man's link to the outside world in order to foster a sense of dependency. Makes a lot of sense. Two, some women are consciously or even unconsciously creating patterns of relationships that they experienced in childhood and they seek out men who resemble their fathers. We see that with research over and over again. So that makes a lot of sense. Number three, some women simply want to suffer and choose this type of relationship knowing they will be subjected to ridicule, stigmatization, and economic hardship. That one is a little tougher for me to fully wrap my head around. It does, that one did not make as much sense to me. In a lot of the examples and kind of more deep dive research, there, there's not as much to me that I found that kind of backs that up. But it's still, again, done with the 1991 research that she did. So it's certainly worth mentioning. And number four, some women are attracted to men whose crimes made them famous, example, serial killers, and are drawn to the notoriety the relationship will bring them over any affection obtained from the relationship. That hits the nail on the head for so much. That explains so much of, as we just talked about, you know, the Richard Ramirez is the Ted Bundy's, those who are attracted to, you know, Joni Ayers. One of you guys mentioned Diane Downs. Again, I'll repeat that because it's really worth repeating. So the fourth idea in Eisenberg's 1991 research, 
Some women are attracted to men whose crimes made them famous, example serial killers, and are drawn to the notoriety that the relationship will bring them over any affection obtained from the actual relationship. So let me just, all right, so I'm going to do a quick pause there and just kind of double check where you guys are in the chats. I think that to me, that research of hers was the most fascinating. And I'm like, spot on, spot on, spot on. Number three, I didn't quite, quite agree with that. But again, that's what her research showed. So that's what we're going with. Let's see. Okay. Oh, Violet, that's, we are certainly talking about that later. <laughs> um Criminals are a big turnoff to me, but my daughter seems to have a real taste for shit with felons. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is so interesting. Uh, da, 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 da. The reason some women like bad criminals is evolutionary. It goes back thousands of years and women would pick the biggest, baddest man because he could protect her and her offspring. James, very good point. I'm not going to point out the fact that you... You're a lot older, so you were probably alive during that time, but that's okay. That's okay. We don't, we don't need to, we don't need to do that. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you. I completely agree. This, like, anything psychology, I am, I am so down to talk about with you guys. So, all right. So we just went over those four different types of, of woman, right? that the research showed. So also some women seek a relationship that allows them to play the caretaking role, um, as we talked about, and to foster that sense of dependency from their partners. So we talked about that just very briefly in that example. So what that means more specifically is women engage in this type of relationship to compensate for feelings of worthlessness. In that in being with an incarcerated man, the woman is provided stimulation in a sense of importance she would not otherwise experience. So now we're getting deeper, right? We're getting more into the individual, in this case, the woman's self-esteem, the feeling of worthlessness, feeling, okay, being with incarcerated male, she's going to develop a sense of importance she would not experience otherwise in the normal outside world right so we're getting we're getting somewhere we're getting deeper into the person themselves who is seeking the relationship not not so much the inmate with this type of woman so this character characterization Oh my gosh, y'all. It's definitely a weekday night because I just can't speak. Then again, I butcher words on the weekends too. Let's be real. So this characterization is certainly in line with what's called narcissistic injury, that theory. So this theory, what that means is it holds that some women who have been subjected to harmful experiences during their early years of life have not been able to develop a healthy sense of self. And as a result, choose a partner with whom they can unconsciously become intertwined with, thereby becoming, quote unquote, whole again. So now we're getting a little bit deeper into the psyche of somebody here who is looking for love with an inmate. And I'm not going to lie. I was not familiar with the term narcissistic injury theory. So that's why the research just kind of threw that out there. And I'm like, wait a minute. But what is that? So that's why I, I grabbed that example and what that theory really means, because I, I had no clue what that meant, in all honesty. So Eisenberg continued her research, right? And in 2000, what was, um, what research was published then was that women involved in relationships with prison inmates seek romantic love to bring them excitement, drama, and an escape from the pain and reality of an otherwise mundane existence. There we go. There we go. Think of the examples that we're talking about, right? The type of, and I know that they're more popular examples of, you know, I just, I threw out there at the beginning star in regards to Charles Manson. This 
research to me was spot on. So I'll repeat it again. So women involved in relationships with prison inmates seek romantic love to bring them excitement, drama, and an escape from the pain and reality of an otherwise mundane existence. You're not going to have just your basic everyday life if you're, you know, just dating John Smith who lives next door, right? When you're in a relationship with somebody, especially who's a pro high profile criminal, you're going to have, it, it's a lot of times it's going to be public, even if it's not a nationwide known offender. And if it's just more, maybe somebody known locally in your state or locally in your county, um, that still sometimes is news there. Um, what I found was some, when I was doing the research, right? Some, yeah, there's Hugo. I did let him, let him stay in for this. So there was some uh, examples that it gave of women who were involved with male criminals that were just kind of more Massachusetts based. And some of those offenders I've never even heard of, but again, it, that's not going to make national news because it's just more to my area. So, but again, it made news. So again, you're not going to have a mundane existence in this case. So the women go through limitless suffering and are considered victims of love because they have no control over their feelings. This is what Eisenberg's research in 2000 also shows. They view the inmate as a romantic hero and excuse, forgive, and rationalize the inmate's criminal acts. The women describe their inmate partners as caring, thoughtful, warm, and funny. The inmates have control over the women by providing them with the love and acceptance they seek that they cannot find on the outside. That is fascinating. Fascinating. Think about the sentence that I, these both, both sentences, right? To me, I really stick to the one prior. So the, the view is that they are viewed as a romantic hero and can excuse, forgive, and rationalize the inmates' criminal acts. That makes so much sense. With the case of Chris Watts, right? And he's he's one of my examples at the end, but he's the best example to give this now, right? I will be covering that case on my channel, but for those who haven't heard it in the briefest of nutshells, he killed his pregnant wife, uh, Cheyenne Watts, and their two young, young daughters, um, CC and Bella. He is right now the most popular male inmate when it comes to women seeking, seeking relationships, seeking friendship, seeking love with him, right? And it's time and time again where you see these, you know what he did. He was convicted, but there's the yes, he did this, but he wouldn't do that to me, or yes, he did this. However, but the, the however's in the buts, that's the ex making excuses. That is the forgiving. That is the rationalizing exactly what Eisenberg's research is talking about. So keep that in mind. That's just spot, spot on. All right. Some of you guys have said some really great things while I was talking about that. So I want to... Just make sure I don't brush over it. Do they still have conjugal visits in prisons? It is, that's not a one blanket answer. I would say it's not only state by state dependent, but county by county. So I would, if you're interested in a specific area, like, is it, is it okay where I live? You can look that up and find that. But there's no one blanket answer for, for example, for the United States. It's it varies um, as well as in other countries. It varies. So, um, yeah, it's hard to answer that. We know what happened in regards to California with, you know, Tex Watson having four kids and then that got stopped. But again, we know even if you find the let's say you, you you look up in your state and your state overall says there are no conjugal visits allowed. Is it happening in reality? Yeah, it is. You know, our guards looking the other way. Are they paid off? 
it happens. So we just have to keep that in mind too, but, but good question. Beckham just talking randomly. James says people may be into dating, uh, prison, dating prisons for the same way people online date, no real commitment. Great point. That's a great, great point. Let's see your cat. I know, I know, but he knew if he stayed, if he was in here when I started, then he, he was going to be in here for the duration. So he'll be fine. He'll be fine. Um, let's see. Okay. So now we jump to what is the social exchange theory. So very excited to talk about this. So this theory proposes that we enter into a relationship with another when we perceive, oh my God, that was so Boston. <laughs> when we perceive the benefits of doing so outweigh the costs. So what does that mean? The applications of this theory to romantic relationships with an incarcerated partner were apparent in the research. So for example, right, if a woman desires a relationship that allows her a great deal of power and control. That involves to her limited physical contact and that comes without the constraints of family or that allows her to appear selfless and giving towards someone in a lower position than herself. In a relationship with an incarcerated man may hold many of these benefits. So again, there's going to be that area of power. I am helping somebody who is, I hate to say lower in the rankings, but research says a lower position than herself or himself, right? And I'm helping, I'm caring, I'm all of these wonderful qualities towards this person who does not have any of these things. They may not have other family any other friends, you know, what, what is somebody who's incarcerated missing? Now I'm stepping in and I'm providing all of that. I'm helping somebody who's in a lower position. It's like on the one hand, you could see, think about it. We went back earlier, right? Towards there's the, if I talk about this, the same example, I might, there's humiliation I might suffer because it's not normal. But in here, the person, same example, right, is thinking, I might get attributed all these wonderful qualities because I'm now in a relationship with somebody who needs something, who needs me, who needs this, who needs this, because they don't have any of these other things. I'm there to help. So it's it's different how the research has shown, same, if we're looking at the same example, one does, might not want to talk about it because of the sense of humiliation that they're going to get because it's not a societal norm. And the other one thinks, I'm going to get all these wonderful attributes, these great attributes for my relationship with this person because I'm doing wonderful things for them. It's interesting. Uh, Danny, is it because they like the intensity of the relationship? That's... I wouldn't say necessarily in this example, not in, in regards to social exchange theory, but in some of the examples, um, Bill, if you were here a little earlier, there was the research that had, I just want to make sure I don't lose my place here, the four different types of, oops, sorry, nope, wrong one, all right, uh, four different types of patterns in some, one of them was, um, let's see. So women who pursue relationships and are sexually attracted to serial violent offenders, women who are sexually attracted or sexually satisfied by partners participating in criminal behavior, women who participate in and facilitate criminal behavior with a romantic partner versus women who just pursue romantic relationships. So there was I would say an intensity of the level of involvement these women were seeking with these men. Some more like the first one is I'm just seeking a relationship with one. One is I'm seeking a relationship with a man, but I want to be facilitating and participate in the crime. So there's that next intense, intense step. I would say it's too good to knock down my stuff. 
<laughs> cat life. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of what I would look at for that. Women like fixing bums. The way I would word that, Renee, you're not wrong. The word I would, way I would word it is think about it growing up or we all know whether it was ourselves, whether it was our family members, our siblings, our cousins, our friends who would date the bad boy or date the bad girl, date the person who, you know, they just need, they just need me to you know, I can help fix them. I can help make them better. We all, and that's not just something that stops in high school, by the way, that goes throughout life. We can meet people at any age level who is dating that type of person. So that is a wonderful, wonderful example. Uh, someone in Danny's closet is going, <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Um, if I were in prison, or at least I can touch you. <laughs> Okay. So we just went over social exchange theory. So a little bit more. Again, there was a decent amount of research done on this topic, which I was pleasantly surprised. I think I just wish there was so much more. <laughs> so, oh, hey, Charlie16, welcome. So Wilcox and Bailey, they did research that came out in 1999, and it hypothesized that some women may seek partners whose personality, characteristics, or life circumstances leave them in a place where they are easily manipulated through the use of rewards and punishments, and that these women use manipulation of their partners as a means of satisfying their own internal desires to achieving some sort of control over others. So the way the definition started, it kind of, to me, made it sound like, okay, are these women who are seeking male inmates, are they the ones being manipulated? Kind of seemed like it started to go that way. And it's like, no, 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 wait a minute. These women are using manipulation of the partners that they're seeking, these male inmates, as a means of satisfying their own internal desires and achieving some sort of control over others. And it makes sense, right? You're seeking somebody who is in an extremely limited capacity. So you're going to have so much more control over, over them. Makes a lot of sense. So it's easy to see that someone who's looking for that type of dominant type relationship, this would be the perfect setup, right? You're controlling quite a bit. So a look into the backgrounds and upbringing of women who become involved in relationships with prison inmates. This is the good stuff. So before somebody jumps in and says, wait a minute, wait a minute, this is just a general overview of what previous research has, has said. So does every individual example that we can think of or talk about, you know, for example, the women who went off to Richard Ramirez or Chad Bundy, does all of these women fall under these particular categories? Not necessarily, but this is just the, in a nutshell, what was, and there's Tuca scratching the futon in protest. Tuca. <laughs> Cat mom life, y'all. All right. So in general, what the research has shown, Women who become involved with incarcerated men may have previously been in problematic marriages and experienced alcoholism, drug abuse, violence, infidelity, and sexual deviance within their own family unit. Some women had a history of emotional, physical, and sexual abuse and became involved with violent criminals as they are guaranteed safety within a relationship with an inmate, as generally physical contact is restricted. As we talked about, some prisons do not allow conjugal visits. And they can communicate by phone and mail, ensuring that she will not be hurt again. Quote, unlike in their childhood, these women can control the relationship with men in prison. They decide when to visit and when to walk away. End quote. That makes a lot of, I went to say two words at once. 
that makes a lot of sense. It's putting the woman in a position of power where she thinks she's in a position of power. Again, where she thinks she's in a position of power. But based on some of these past criteria, makes a lot of sense, right? Thank you for stopping back in. If you didn't already like the video, Paul, at least do something right. If I were Danny, I would not be turning my back on that cat. Oh, no, he's my, he's like, he's just a giant fluff ball, fluff ball of love. So he's fine. Uh, let's see. Okay. Maybe some. No, no. It's all good. He's all good. <laughs> cat life. <laughs> all right. So. So what is the evidence from, from this, right? So the evidence that was provided to validate the theory that women who come from abusive and dysfunctional families may tend to choose inappropriate relationships with prison inmates because they feel safe from abuse, they have poor self-esteem, and they want to rebel against their family. Think about some of the examples. I know I'm going back to you know, the example of star with Charles Manson, right? Because, you know, society speaking, Charles Manson has been defined by the media as the most evil of that evil can be. And now you're the person who's going to date him. Think of how that would be perceived by family, by friends, by coworkers, Think of that example, that research right here, right? They want to rebel against family. That's the ultimate way to rebel. Mom, look who I'm dating type of thing, right? I'm not getting into, you know, I don't know Star's background um, in regards to, and I don't want to dive into, okay, that's a lie. I don't want to dive into someone specifically and start analyzing them per se. You know, it's one thing to give the example, but to then take an individual like that and say, oh, well, this, 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 and then the, that's a, that's too much and that's not what we're doing. So I just want to say that. So any examples that I'm giving are just more general examples of the person, not so much. Let's get into their history of trauma and abuse growing up and so on and so forth. We're not doing that. So we are getting there, folks. Again, a lot of research on this. So um, I think it is a power trip or a martyr issue. That's exactly what one of the theories is saying. Yeah, it's putting these, again, the research was done as women, putting these women in a position of power. They have the ultimate power over somebody whose choices are very limited. They can't go anywhere. They have to have permission to use the phone, to write a letter, to do, to do so many things. So where you, as the woman, have this life on the outside, you're with somebody who's very limited choices on the inside. So it is a position of power, right? Different rankings. Um, from narcissistic abusive background. Yep, spot on. A big control factor that she may have the law on her side if something goes wrong. That's interesting. That's interesting. I almost, yeah, I think I view it more, I'm thinking from like maybe a media perspective of if something goes wrong, I'm just watching what Tube is going to do next. If something goes wrong, I think, you know, some may look at it and be like, well, what did she expect? type of, not I guess not necessarily that prison guards or a judge or, you know, the courts would think that necessarily, but I think a lot of society might think, what did, what, well, what did she expect going with someone like him, you know, type of thing. They have a fear of abandonment. Mm -hmm. A person can't leave. They literally can't leave. You know where they are. They can't leave. And we're not even getting into the, well, do you think you're really the only one? You're the only one they're writing. You know what I mean? We saw so many times with, you know, doing the, um, oh God, what example was it? 
Oh, yeah, Richard Ramirez, right? So many women thought they were the only ones and he was writing so many women. It's, you're not the only one. So, but they, in this case, they might think that they might turn a blind eye. I mean, people turn a blind eye in the everyday normal outside world when their spouse is, you know, they or they may suspect their spouse is doing something. So it wouldn't be any different to me for somebody in prison, but at least you know where they are. So yeah, that's a whole nother ballpark. Um, so um, let's see one more thing and then I'll, it's sort of human nature to try and fix things. You find someone with a massively troubled past is perhaps seen as a project. Spot on, spot on. I can say I know of friends personally who have dated, you know, have a pattern of dating the, the bad guy or the, the one with just, I'll just blatantly say some issues or out, you know, unresolved problems where it's, I can fix them. I can fix them. And then it doesn't work. Go on to the next brain. It's like the same pattern. We, we all know someone who who's dated those type of people. Right. But yeah, Wolf, you're spot on with that. You're spot on with that. So I might have to just quickly wait. Is he going back up? All right. Yeah. He'll be fine. I was gonna say, let him out of the room, but all right. So there are two type of hyperstaphylia, passive hyperstaphylia and aggressive hyperstaphylia. So what are those two differences? So passive hyperstaphylia, it co comprises of those individuals who have no desire to participate in criminal activity themselves, but are sexually attracted to criminals, the so-called quote unquote, we all know the term prison groupies, end quote, or quote, serial killer groupies, end quote. These women are usually delusional and will try, and this is what the researcher said. So I'm not, I'm not paraphrasing here. This is what it says. The women are usually delusional and will try to find excuses for what the criminal did. They will develop relationships with a criminal and feel that they are special. That even though their lover may have killed numerous people, he would never harm her. They usually feel that they can quote, change and quote their lover and have rescue fantasies. Passive hyperstaphiliacs tend to put themselves in positions to be seduced, manipulated, and lied to by the people they fall for. I just threw a lot at you guys in that, but it makes, again, that definition, prison groupies. We all know that. We all know that term. That is where this fits in. Oh my gosh, you guys are so funny. Uh, Bundy said that to his girlfriend. Um, do you mean Carol Ann Boone, who then turned into his wife on the stand? Or do you mean Elizabeth Kendall? I think you mean Elizabeth Kendall. But I just want to make sure we're talking about the right person. Richard Mayer said if it wasn't for all the letters and all the people wanting to visit him, he would have killed himself in prison. You know... It definitely brought him a level of notoriety. So both good and bad, to be honest. All right, guys, we're winding towards the end here. So that second type of herbristophilia, aggressive herbristophilia, it comprises of those individuals who actively help. So typically male criminals to commit the crimes. Some people, usually female, will help out their lovers with their criminal agenda by luring victims, hiding bodies, covering crimes, or even committing crimes. They are attracted to their lovers because of their violent actions and want to receive love, yet are unable to understand that their lovers are psychopaths who are manipulating them. Both passive and aggressive hyperstaphiliacs tend to end up in abusive or unhealthy relationships. So the example that initially stands out to me, if you didn't know a lot about the case, would be in Paul, Paul Cast in Fiddle. You guys know this one. Canadian Ken and Barbie, Carla Hamolka, Paul Bernardo. If you don't know a ton about the case, you think, you know, she helped Carla help lure the victims. 
She helped hide the bodies, covered up her husband's crimes. They, she wanted to help her husband. But as we know, Paul Bernardo, a complete psychopath. What we then learned down the road, of course, after the deal was done, was she was just as involved. If you missed that episode, I did that. I covered Carla Hamilka, Paul Bernardo, and Danny After Dark. So check that out. But I think if you, again, if you just know a little bit about the case, you think, I would think, wow, that's a perfect example. But then there's more layers to, okay, no, Carla was really just as involved. But this makes a lot of sense. So, okay, you guys, that is the research that I have. Oh my gosh, almost an hour. That's awesome. So I just threw a lot of information at you guys. When I say I went through so much research for this, you know, the, and I really enjoyed reading research, research papers. It's been quite a while in regards to, you know, a lot of these were college level or people who, you know, who are doing research through different universities where they work and so on and so forth. So to read, it's like, here's the study. Here are, you know, control group A, control B, and, you know, how are these, you know, everything about the research project. I read through all of it. And then just to be like, all right, so what, how can I take 20 pages of research from this one person and condense it for you guys in a, a way that, okay, this is easy to understand type of thing. So again, if anybody wants to deep dive more into any of this, there are some great researchers that I mentioned. I put the um, names of the studies, the authors in the description bar. So definitely check that out. So who says I'm not fiddle? I missed what that's referring to. Danny, I love your top. Oh, thank you. So, okay, I threw a lot of information at you guys, but I asked you at the beginning to think of examples. And I think as the show has gone on, you guys were great in bringing those up where you saw it was relevant, right? So, we talked about already Richard Ramirez, Ted Bundy, the, the classics, right? Scott Peterson was the the guy that so many women were writing to in jail until along came Chris Watts that in that part of it you know there are similarities with them they both killed their pregnant spouses the difference is Chris Watts also killed his two young daughters and it's interesting that women can overlook that. And I know with, with Chris Watts, it's a little different with Scott Peterson because with Scott Peterson, there's still this whole, is he a very big divide of people that think he's innocent and people who think he's guilty. I've really not met anybody or come across anybody that is, gee, I'm not really sure. There seems to be, yes, he did it or no, he didn't. And large side large groups of people on each side with Chris Watts. It's a little bit different. He avoided trial. So then he did it. And then he tried to, you know, spin it on it, you know, Cheyenne, his wife. And you know, that I was, she was harming the kids and I, all that shit. We'll get into that when I cover that case, but it's very interesting that as a woman to see, for example, just someone like Chris Watts and think, well, I know he did this to his pregnant wife and to his two daughters, but he wouldn't do that to me. Or, oh, I, I bet there was a reason. I don't know. You know, we have the research. And a lot of the research that I read through today, obviously, each of those, part of when a research project is presented, there's uh, a section where it says, you know, what information or what research need to be needs to be done in the future based off this. And you know, of course, I would say, you know, more needs to be done in regards to X, Y, and Z. It doesn't, 
get into, there hasn't been a lot recently in regards to, I would want to know, yes, we know that women or excuses are being made, but I'd want more of a deep dive into, instead of this group of, okay, there's out of a hundred women, 80 who percent who fall in love with a killer are making those excuses. Well, we have a bit of technically speaking why, but I want that research to even get more narrower. I want to know more. That's just me personally. So research idea for anybody in graduate school who happens to see this, that's what I'd be, be very, very interested in. So no one was chasing Bernie Madoff. Um, women chase Scott Peterson because they look like Ben Affleck. All women have a Batman fetish. And there's something to say that, you know, because, you know, when an attractive individual, okay. So there's a theory called, um, like the, the halo, the halo effect, the halo, the halo theory, right? And it is where there's a good, a, tr a good looking, attractive person. And we associate all of these great qualities to them automatically because of that. Um, you know, based on their looks, they're attractive. They must be, they must be hardworking. They must be kind. They must be gentle. Like all these qualities, we've never even met the person, but we're going to attribute it to them because they're a good looking individual. We expect more. We think that they automatically have these great qualities. In reality, they might not have any of them. So there might be something to be said for these women who are looking at, you know, the Scott Petersons of jail, the Chris Watts, you know, that are in jail. And yes, they did these horrific things, but they're these good looking individuals. So they, besides the crimes they committed, they must have these other great traits because that's just what research has shown that we do. We give good attributes we put that on people who are good looking. Let's see. Hi, welcome. Um, I can imagine Danny on a major network discussing true crime. She's just, oh my God, Virginia Woolf, I'm gonna cry. Thank you. Susan Atkins, I can see wanting to hook up with a reformed Susan Atkins. Oh my God, Wolf, I shouldn't have highlighted that. You're jumping the gun. I was just about to get to the women. Um, I hear Dahmer was writing to women pretending to be in a relationship with them, even though he was gay. I'm, I've not heard that. I've not heard that. Not to say that isn't true. I just, I just haven't. I haven't heard that. Women who write to Chris Watts, I'm sure they see themselves in the role of, um, I'm going to pronounce that wrong. Nicole, as he personally killed Shanann and the kids for them as a symbol of love for them personally. Interesting. Interesting. So we talked a lot, again, because that's just the way the research was done on women seeking love from male inmates. But men, you are not getting off the hook. You are not getting off the hook. Men are just as into female prisoners. Hi, welcome. Long time no see. So I'm going to bring it up now, even though it's at the end of my list, but Wolf, Wolf brought it up. Susan Atkins, and especially you can't mention Susan Atkins without saying Leslie Van Houten. So for anybody, again, who doesn't know me from the Man Society discussion panel over on the podcast, where it's just the Manson case and we discuss that, there has there's such a fascination with Leslie Van Houten. And again, there was big breaking news about Leslie Van Houten today in regards to parole and parole eligibility. We're, we're not going into that here, but check it out if that's, you know, if you want to learn more about that, that just broke today. So Leslie Van Houten, parole and her parole eligibility. So look that up. But there's so much interest in Leslie and so much interest in Susan. Susan's, you know, she's now deceased, but think of how many times she's been married. And, you know, we've all seen pictures of her with her, with her, with her husbands and so on and so forth. 
and heard about the conjugal visits that she had, would she, you know, I would she have had the type of men that were into her in prison be into her on the on the outside? Probably not. I'll just so be bold and say that probably not. Some people might disagree and say, well, yeah, she probably could have attracted them on the outside. Maybe I disagree, but I tend to see a lot of, again, giving credit where credit is due, you know, Dylan, Dylan right there. Leslie was hot in my opinion. Yeah, credit where credit is due. She was a very attractive girl. And that is just in the research about her as well. You know, she was very beautiful back in her, you know, high school days and so on and so forth. And yet, you know, she is where she is now. So Leslie was the prettiest, but she sounded so dumb. Well, you know, women can't always be both things, but good thing I'm both smart and beautiful. Subscribe to Danny After Dark if you're not already. Okay. All right. All right. Who the hell cares, Bill? Who the hell cares? Yeah. See, Leslie back in the day was a hottie. Yep. Yeah. She was certainly, she was absolutely attractive back then. So somebody mentioned earlier, I did not forget you. I'm blinking who mentioned it. Uh, Diane Downs, right? And you can't mention Diane Downs without mentioning Susan Smith. Not just because of the crimes that they did were pretty much similar in murdering or Susan was successful. Diane was successful in, in murdering one and um, permanently injuring two of her children for, I covered both of these on my channel. So go back, Diane Down, Susan Smith, if you are not familiar with it, but in the briefest of nutshells, killed their children to be with um, other men who didn't want children in their life. So this was the way to go about it. You know, I, I found this guy, you know, he's my soulmate. Oh gosh, he doesn't want kids in my life. I have kids. I'll off the kids to be with them. Briefest of nutshells. So these both women, very popular in, in, in uh, prison. And the thing is, and it's a whole nother thing to me. And it's not just males on the outside. It's prison guards. If you do your research on them, Susan Smith, she has gotten several, several, several male guards, their jobs for having sex with her, for getting caught, for doing X, Y, and Z with her, special favors, so on and so forth. Why? I hate to see, I could understand it more by, you know, somebody on the outside, maybe who isn't as familiar with you know, criminal life and so on. But you would like to think somebody in law enforcement who is, this is their job. They are trained to look for certain things. No, they're not psychologists per se. They're, you know, maybe just guards of the prison, right? But they still make these choices with these women or on the flip side, um, female, oh gosh, I'm blanking her name. That, that female uh, case that we had, remember she, was a guard and she helped her prison boyfriend escape. And then they were on the run. She ended up committing suicide. He was supposed to kill himself if they were going to get caught, but then he turned himself in. Oh my gosh. It was like a nationwide case. I'm, I can picture her and him, but I'm blanking. And then they got caught because he wanted to take the car to a car wash and he showed up on camera and like, you can hear the audio footage from the vehicle where she's like, I, I knew we shouldn't have gone to the car wash. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. That blonde chick, Ella. Yes. I, I can picture her right now and I'm blanking her name. Um, but yeah, female guards hooking up with male inmates was or still is a big, it's still, it goes both ways. And I don't know why to me, that's a whole, fascinating. That would be an area of research in itself that I would like to see done based on the level of research that we already know about hyperstophilia. Vicki White, thank you. Thank you, Ella. Yes, that's it. And that's a recent case. That just happened. 
you know, I know some of the examples I'm giving, you know, the, the ones that we know about, you know, Richard, Bundy, Scott Peterson, you know, Chris Watts is more relatively new, but, you know, Diane Downs, Susan Smith, yes, they still have interactions with male guards and then they get in trouble. That hasn't stopped. Um, but Vicki White, that just happened. So this isn't something that happened in the past. Research is done in regards to you know, male guards or female guards with inmates, this is happening now. It is fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. And that's, again, any college students are watching this, a area of research that I would love if somebody wanted to take over and deep dive more into, because how does that happen? How does that happen where somebody, this is their career. This is, this is what they do for a living. They're supposed to be more trained. This is their job, yet they get caught up. They get swept up. How does that happen? Danny, when you're on the outside looking in on the crime world, you see it differently. Yeah. Yep. Tony, you're absolutely right. They made a movie about one lady helped him escape through a pipe under the prison. I don't know what movie you're referring to offhand. Do a quick Google search. This is so common. Thank you, James. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Surprised there isn't more Epstein deaths in prison. Oh, my gosh. I mean, yeah, and that's a whole, yes, he did it. No, he didn't. I mean, oh, my gosh. Vicki White and Casey White. Yep. And then the last name was by no relation. Uh, the Alabama prison guard and the dangerous inmate who she helped escape spoke on the phone overnight. Yes. Thank, thank you, Bill. Thank you for getting all that extra information. You think Maxwell gets love letters? You know, it's a woman who had had so much money and power. I guarantee there's men writing to her. I guarantee it. I mean, why, why would they not? Think about it. Alex Murdoch, he has a ton of women writing to him. I just covered that on one of um, my recent uh, True Crime and Chills because that was, you know, updated information and on, on him, you know, again, and he's sentenced. He was found guilty of murdering his wife and one of his adult kids. And yet, Yet he's very popular with the ladies. I don't get it. And, you know, in regards to giving credit where credit is due, credit is not due in his case. I'm looking at, I look at his picture. I'm like, I don't get it. I don't, I don't get it. Besides the, the wealth and everything. I don't get it. But that sounds like Shawshank production. Uh, let's see. Uh, Rachel was a prison guard. Only hire guards with... Oh, my God, James. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Epstein faked his death and the guards helped him escape. Uh, that, you know, like that's... I have heard that theory. I have heard that theory, but... All right, you guys. So I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. This was some... Again, psychology stuff, I'm, I love, love talking about it with you guys. And if you want to hear more about this in regards to specifically the Manson case, I did do an episode with uh, my co-host Paul and Mr. Beckham over on the Paul cast Manson Saga discussion panel. We, and again, I didn't get this much in depth with research that I don't think the guys would have... <laughs> they would have fallen asleep, <laughs> but taking what, re what was relevant to that case and then discussing it with the people involved with the whole Manson family and their, you know, their spouses and so on and so forth. I did that over there. So check that out. If this is something that you want to hear made specifically to a certain case and while you're there, and if you haven't seen any of the episodes, there's 
so many, so many episodes that we did if you're into the Manson case. So go over there, check it out, like those videos, so on and so forth. Other than that, you guys, thank you so much for joining me for tonight's episode. And thank you for, again, pleasing the nerdy side of me that just loves to talk psychology. And thank you so much for being so interactive and involved with this. Not, you know, I did think I'm like, you know, I could just talk about the research and people could say, okay, okay, I'm here because it's a place to hang out or, but you guys really got involved in it. So it really genuinely makes me so happy. So thank you for that, for having this dialogue with you guys. And yeah, it was so much fun. I will be doing a true crime and chill later this week. Um, based on my schedule this weekend, I'm not sure what night that will be. So as soon as I know, I will throw up a, uh, throw up something on YouTube with when the event will be. So stay tuned for that. Other than that, everybody, I hope you have a wonderful night and a great rest of your week. And until next time, remember, we don't live in darkness. Darkness lives in us. <laughs>